Hi and welcome back to Elden Ring The Ultimate Guide Part 30. Today it is Shunning Grounds. If this is the first time you've watched any of these guides then we recommend you watch the video linked in the description. If you've got any tips of your own, stick them in the pinned tips comment. That way people can look over for more tips for the area. But otherwise we are in the subterranean Shunning Grounds, we're at the First Grace. And we are going to head northeast-ish towards these omens. Or we're going to grab this Golden Ring 11 and we are just going to avoid the enemies for now. Um, because you don't need to fight them just now, despite the fact that they are fairly easy. But instead, we're just going to drop down here. Uh, because if we don't, if we don't need to fight them, why are we, why are we going to fight them? So we picked up a wee freezing grease just there, and uh, some serpent arrows. And now there is a bunch of imps in this area. Now we've dealt with these imps many, many a time before. Uh, so just to reiterate, the strategy is you're just going to use guard counters on them. Uh, so you're gonna hold your you're gonna hold your block up, bounce off the shield, hit R2 for the guard counter, and that is that is the way to beat the imps nice and easy. Pretty much with whatever weapon you're using, to be honest. But there's a lot of imps in this particular part, so just be careful to keep your guard up because, I mean, you really don't want to get swarmed by these things because then they can be a price solid issue. We've mentioned it in several parts before, but imps can drop the forked hatchet, the forked greatsword, the imp heads, uh, wolf, cat, fanged, and uh, long tongued. Long tongued, yep. Yeah, as well as various um, crafting components. And the only other enemy we think that actually has a drop in this area is the omens. As you saw, we run past a couple on our way to the top of these pipes, and they can drop the omen cleaver. A curved greatsword, as well as the warped axe, a standard axe with very, very good strength scaling. And that's going to be pretty much it for drops for this entire part, so that's quite cool. Now, this part has quite complicated um, paths of progression, I suppose. All the pipes that we're running on eventually we have to run through, so just bear that in mind and try and, try and uh, follow what we're doing pretty much to the letter. But uh, yeah, this was an omen hiding in the corner, and we are just going to use a crown slam or jump in L1s. Now, strictly speaking, uh, I would also suggest using um, Lion's Claw in this area. It is going to be better than ground slam against the omens because it comes out a bit faster. So just bear that in mind. I know we've been using ground slam, and we've been saying to use Lion's Claw a lot of the time because uh, it, pr it is probably a slightly better... Um, but otherwise, yeah, that's shadow bait. And now this opens up a shortcut to when we came out the grace and we we headed uh, left. This is a shortcut that is to the right of the grace. Yeah, there's lots of loops in this area. It's I think actually one of the better designed levels in Elden Ring. It's yeah, very it totally intricate. Is. There's lots of loops and shortcuts and secrets, and it's tied to an ending. Um, there's an actual dungeon dungeon down here, as well as it being a legacy dungeon in and of itself. It's it's really cool. Yeah, no, this is cool. Um, so now we're dropping down this kind of like open sewer grate kind of passage, uh, which is still heading out left from the grace and then kind of going further to the bit that we dropped down. But uh, yeah, so we're just going to... just We're just grabbing the items. There's some Miranda flowers here. We ain't fighting them. Why would we? Literally no point. You should be careful as you're climbing up this ladder, actually, because if the Miranda flower does that Miranda's prayer, the attack by beams of light come out of the floor. If it does it as you're climbing up the ladder, they can chip you down until the point where you fall off, and then when you're prone on the floor, the attack can still hit you. So, um, if possible, try and bait that attack out before you start climbing the ladder. So, what you saw us do there was take a wide angle around that hidden hand. You're able to kind of get the jump on the hand so if you were to go for the item it would just kind of grab you but if you can uh, do some charged r2s and you can actually stun the hand and then it's just not a problem so i kind of, kind of copy what we've done there so we used the sewer jail key to open up this bit and uh now we're going to speak to the dung eater because he gave us the key earlier in the guide and now we just speak to him and now we're just gonna head back down here and then there's another hole in the wall that leads to more sewer Epic. The dialogue option you had to pick at the Dung Eater was leave your jail, um, to be clear, so you get two options. Um, make sure you pick the top one, leave your jail. Uh, 
drop down to another hole on the floor there. And yes. here are some of the mini revenant enemies. Um, the same ones that are damaged if you heal near them. And that should be your indication that you know there is a revenant coming up. Um, it's in a big wide open area. So make sure when you do get to the point where you, uh, you are behind it, uh, ready your heal immediately. So I th so think so. This is a different hole that we're dropping down. Um, I think we drop down the first hole, and then that loops back to just after that first hole, and then we continue on, and this is essentially the second hole. But yeah, and, and this is also in sort of in the same room that we dropped down into, except there's a wall that is uh, separating the two sides. So we dropped off into the the other side of the wall, and then when you drop down that second hole, you drop down into the other side that you didn't drop down into initially but yeah there's yeah, the two halves of the the two halves of the room are divided by like uh, a fence almost yeah there You'll is see there. It as we approach this end of the room uh yeah as i said though if you get behind the revenant it actually didn't aggro onto you because it never saw you which was nice so yeah just uh to reiterate using the heal miracle to kill the to stun the revenant and then kill it in the second cast Definitely, definitely, probably the best tip of the entire guide, to be honest. So, we're heading down uh, this sewer passage, obviously, but at the end of this sewer passage is a bit of a slightly tricky encounter because the, there's like there's two omens and then a third one can kind of join in. This is definitely an example of where Lion's Claw would have been better, so just kind of reiterating that. This guy jumps down. If you don't kill this guy fast enough, another omen will jump down and then there's because there's two up the ladder so you want to just get lion's claw and just start hammering at these guys as fast as possible to be honest i was uh not doing enough if i was using jumping l1s i would probably have maybe frostbit this guy or bled him faster but yeah you might be noticing as well that there was a slight cut there and in this footage here we have godric's great rune activated um, that's because we did two runs of this game side by side and what you're seeing here is sort of b-roll footage because when we did this on the main guide run character it went horrendously badly because a third omen jumped down and joined the party and just ruined our day so we're using the footage from the first run instead of the second in this one yes. instance i really don't know why i had godric's run activated but yes that is correct uh, you had it activated because we were trying to cast Law of Regression without respecking. Ah, well remembered, you're right, that was the reason. I guess we just never died since trying that. But yeah, as yeah, you can exactly. see, I think the jumping L1s... So either jumping L1s or just the... You're doing way more damage by using utilising the two great stars. So, strictly speaking, Lion's Claw or using the L1, like the, the, the power stance to move set is going to take care of those omens that were down the ladder faster and thus you're, you're going to mitigate the chance of three of them ganging up on you because you really don't want that to happen. So open up that cave. door. So, um, so this, this, this is uh, the far end of the big street, the underground um, passageway where the yes. grace is. So that's... Uh, so so the, the sewer gate that we jumped down to, that's... There's like a... We just opened the gate past that, so it means we wouldn't need to jump down the sewer gate. We can just go straight to the door that we just opened. So grabbing uh, a couple of things, and then there was like a little bit of a tricky drop. Just need to be just be careful, and there's also a scarab immediately here, so just be just be careful. And as you can see, that was at that point where we switched the footage back, so we no longer have the great rune active. Everything's back to normal. Yes, and uh, I would just want to say, perfectly cut via me. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, it would have been invisible had I not pointed it out. Yeah, perfect cuts in chat. <laughs> so, yeah, this is, again, just more progression. So this is, we're coming up to the bit that we have mentioned a couple of times in the guide now, where the Beast Repellent Torch would be extremely useful. Uh, you do want to put on uh, Prince of Death's uh, postulate just in case. But actually, we completely forgot about the Beast Repellent Torch. You should have that active, equipped in your hand and out, and it will um, 
stop the basilisks from attacking you for the most part. Maybe maybe one cheeky one will make a will like blow some death death cloud at you, but otherwise the beast repellent torch will um effectively render them immobile because they're scared of it or something, I don't know. So yeah, just just remember the beast repellent torch is very fucking good at just making basilisks leave you alone. And you get that from the merchant in Dragon Barrel. We already have been there, we've already got the beast repellent torch. If you've been following the guide, you should have it. We picked up the Nomad's Ashes. We did. Just a moment ago. And the Nomad's Ashes are quite cool. Um, it summons effectively a merchant. Not one that you can trade with, but one that casts um, Frenzied Flame incantations in combat. And um, interestingly enough, because of their ties to the Frenzied Flame in the lore, if you use Frenzied Flaming Stones near it, it will heal it. Cool. So yeah, as you can just see, we really should have just been new. I don't know why I was doing these charged R2s. Just, I think just because they look kind of cool, but definitely just the L1 moveset is just far, far better because you can get the, the frost bite on these guys quite easily. So, you know, one, two great stars is just better than one. And that's uh, dropped the... So we picked up the Omen Baron, uh, which is one of those uh, consumable, uh, like, endless use consumables that use FP to do a little spell. Yeah, basically, it creates these little, um, like, almost like homing soul mass in a sense, where they sort of come out of you and then seek enemies. Um, it doesn't do great damage, but there are a couple of ways to boost it. There's also a stronger version of it that you can get by trading Morgoth's Boss Remembrance uh, with Enya in the Roundtable Hold. So now this is yet another shortcut that we've opened, and this is the door in front of the Grace. Uh, this is a pretty good shortcut for this area. The other ones are kind of more shortcuts for if you died or not, but this is actually a pretty good one in terms of general navigation. God, the imps in this area are hardy, and this is where we're supposed to be as well. Yeah, yeah. The subterranean shunning grounds definitely is another part of the game where the difficulty does spike up a little bit, and you can definitely feel it. We're almost, um, almost at the end game at this point, and um, something that's pretty commonly been said about Elden Ring in general is that the endgame difficulty spikes hard, and this, I think, is one of the early examples of that happening. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. Although, if you follow the guide, you actually have no problem, so... But yeah, watch out for that one particular MP does uh, make a charge at you. The ladder we just kicked down is above the room that had the omen that dropped the omen bairn in and we've just jumped into the pipe in that room and we immediately turned a 180 and headed back in the opposite direction through this uh cage door over here this is yeah, probably the most maze-like section of the sewer network it's so not try and so follow bad, along closely but yeah if you just follow exactly what we're doing um there is a map online it's going to be pretty much impossible to really be able to explain via words what you're supposed to do so just very much just pay close attention pause if you have to and just watch what we're doing and follow that path one for one yeah and um, we and picked up an eye of yellow um i think he actually fell through the ceiling crazy yeah um so we picked up an eye of yellow a warming stone a smithing stone is that a smithing stone eight yes that's a so, huge drop for this area so yeah definitely come here so that whole bit there was like one dead end and then when you go up the slope and to make this kind of u-turn this, this leads to a second dead end so one little bit of shorthand that makes navigating this place easier is there's two dead ends effectively and once you've gotten items from that you can, uh, that's who you're done. And that is it. So that's all the items there. And now we're heading back to where we dropped into the pipe. And now we're going the opposite direction now. Now, if you want to, a little piece of advice for making sure you're navigating that area correctly, whenever you hit a dead end and turn back and exit the pipe, uh, if you drop a rainbow stone, it will let you know that you've been down that path and don't have to do it again if you're struggling to navigate it of your own accord. 
so when we dropped down into that specific hole, well, the last hole we dropped down to into there, if you do an immediate 180 and block, because that one commoner will try to do a backstab on you. Every single fucking time. Bastard. But now we're actually very much near the end of subterranean shunning grounds, and can you believe that there is so much more to do uh, <laughs> as, as a result of this part that um, we're, we're nearly done this area, and yet there's still more than half of the video left to do. So as I've said before, yeah, as I've said before, if there are um, warrior jars in an area, it's usually indicative that there will be a either a cracked pot or a ritual pot somewhere nearby. That rule of thumb has held true through most of the game. So now we are actually in front of Moog's boss room. I can't remember if we actually do Moog just now. Um... Okay, back to the round table hold. Probably going to try and upgrade our weapons if we can. We might have enough. Yeah, quite possibly. Um, and it's possible this detour is also to do with the Dung Eater's quest that we freed right at the start. Possibly. So that was quite cool. Um, we, Because we had two Smith and Stone 8s, we were actually able to upgrade our weapon a little bit. And then we could also upgrade the pulley bow. So sorry for that uh, cut there. I'd there must have been like a lot of shite footage, but ultimately we are back at the subterranean shunning grounds now. And, um, oh yes, actually, no, there's the bottom of the subterranean shunning grounds to do before Moog. So, ah, yeah. Yeah, the, so there's, the, this next bit is a colossal fucking pain in the ass. Um, there's two giant lobsters or langoustines or shrimp or whatever the fuck. Um, right down at the bottom here and they are extremely tough but we're just gonna if anybody has a, a, a surefire way of like fucking killing these things like mega easy by all means please leave it in chat um, I tried various methods even Thunderbolt doesn't work particularly well against them um, I would say again Lion's Claw would be very good because you can't a lot of this guy's attacks will knock you out of most of your attacks they do quite a lot of poise damage but Lion's Claw will let you just completely hyper armor through everything aside from that grab attack right there. So I would suggest Lion's Claw is a, a good method for fighting these things because the biggest problem about these things is they keep knocking you out of your own animations rather than anything else. So yeah, I'd, I'd certainly go for Lion's Claw. Um, I really wish we had more footage of using Lion's Claw rather than just constantly having to recommend it and put it on. But yes, if you have Lion's Claw, you'll definitely have an easier time fighting this thing. Rifle Strike is also putting in some work because it's a near guarantee that you will take some damage fighting the uh, giant lobsters. And so, uh, given that Prayerful Strike heals you for 31% of your max HP, thanks to the Great Stars instead of just 30, um, it, will, it will sort of pay dividends because it means you don't have to try and find the window to heal with a flask as often. Yeah, this is true. Now, uh, we also picked up two Smith and Stone 7s off the ground, and a Sombre Smith and Stone 7, so that's pretty good. Yeah, there's a few of them scattered about at the bottom of here. In the pipe, yes. you can see, just behind the lobster, there is a Teardrop Scarab. Um, and that one also has a pretty high-tier Smithing Stone in. I believe that one's a Sombre 7, actually. One of the rarer uh, Smithing Stones that you can get your hands on. Oh god, these things are annoying, and I can just I can just tell how much Lion's Claw would have made this so much fucking easier, to be honest. Yeah, it would. Like, I almost Electrify... wonder whether... Go on. I was going to say, Electrify Armament plus Lion's Claw would probably be the best combination. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, I almost wonder whether or not... Um... Spectral Lance would have been good here. Maybe if it, if it, it was able to, lock. yeah, if it was able, if Spectral Lance is able to stun lock these things, that, that actually might be quite good because you can quite easily keep your distance and just launch lances. And I do know another Ash of Wall actually that that is pretty good versus the lobsters, especially if you can get them to back themselves into a corner. 
because they do Boy. back up between attacks. Um, Stormcaller. Oh, yeah, yeah, maybe actually, yeah. If you're yeah, if you able to get a Stormcaller off, I could imagine that being quite good. So there's two more Smith and Stone 7s, that's huge. And then there's Moog Shackle, which is definitely the reason why we came here before doing Moog, because Moog Shackle works exactly in the same way as Margaret Shackle. Um, very unnecessary against Moog, I think. Um, it makes him incredibly fucking easy, but so be it. Now, we're heading back up here, because going down uh, the stairs leads to uh, effectively like a, a non-legacy dungeon. That was the, the kind of catacombs dungeon that we were talking about earlier. But going this way leads to the final shortcut of the area. So we're just going to get that out of the way and then head back to the catacombs. And that catacombs that we're about to do is actually one of the more interesting ones in the game. So um, that's something, I guess, because a lot of them are fucking pointless and boring. So. It's sort of similar in a sense to the Oriza Hero's Grave that we did in the final part of Altus, the yes. capital outskirts. Um, but it is easier to navigate than uh, Oriza because it doesn't rely on transporter traps. So, pulling this lever here will open a shortcut back into the Shunning Grounds proper. It moves a stair, um, moves like a big stone slab that was covering a staircase. And I think we're just teleporting back to the start of the Lindell catacombs here. Yes, before because the progressing shortcut on is... to actually do the dungeon. The shortcut is literally functionally useless because you can warp so we're just we're just warping back you you will never use that shortcut guaranteed <laughs> so what you want to do is you want to follow exactly what we are doing this particular so that's ghost glove War six nice but this particular dungeon uh look at it as three i well at the very least three very similar dungeons stacked on top of each other and when you do one loop it looks like you've looked back to the beginning of the first layer but actually when you do one loop it loops you to the start of the second layer so we're currently on layer one and we'll tell you when we get to layer two but it'll be very obvious so we're putting yeah. on market shackle because uh, it is incredible for just activating well moog shackle moog or market shackle works in the same way but you can use the shackle to lower traps for some yeah. reason <laughs> it's definitely uh, definitely not an intentional thing but you can do it You'll know we've moved to the next layer. Um, the room we ran through at the start that had the putrid corpses in it and the altar in the middle of the room, um, you drop down into a second copy of that room whenever you transition layers. Yes. God, is he getting knocked out the jump attack by this guy's kick? That wouldn't happen with Lion's Claw. You would just take the kick damage, but you just go bang and flatten him with Lion's Claw. So, Yeah. <laughs> Lion's Claw is just really good, guys. <laughs> it's the it's the most solid bonk in the game. Fact. Facts, no printer. Um, we just picked up the Crucible Scale Talisman that's similar to the Dragon Scale Talisman from Dark Souls 3 or Gower's Ring of Protection from Dark Souls 2. It effectively um, decreases the amount of damage you take from backstabs. So in PvE, functionally useless. In PvP, also functionally useless because landing backstabs is really rare. So, Grave Glove Wart 9. Nice. And here it looks like this is the uh, this is the layer 2. So, this very much looks like layer 1, but it's designed to disorient you. Do not be fooled if you head back to quote unquote the beginning of the area. It's, it's different. Like, yeah, it's just a dead end with a root resin. Epic. Love a root yes. resin. Yes. <laughs> Uh, but interestingly, this is a fake boss room, as far as I'm aware. So it does really try to trip you up with this. Watch out, because there is a, uh, an omen to the, the the right here, which tries to get the jump on you. A classic Miyazaki trap. Miyazaki moment. <laughs> yeah. Uh, God, getting frostbite on these guys is very satisfying. You know what else would have been really good in this dungeon? Actually, cool. Flaming Strike. Uh, I could see Flaming Strike being pretty good in this dungeon, yeah. I reckon, I reckon Flaming Strike is probably quite good against these guys. I would probably still say Lion's Claw ultimately, but Flaming Strike could work as well. Because in theory, you could get Frostbite to proc on them multiple times if you had uh, Flaming Strike on your offhand. I yeah, I, mean, I suppose so, yeah. Because if you, you didn't do. know, 
Um, an enemy takes fire damage after they have been frostbitten. It takes the frostbite status off, but that means you can get the second burst of damage from proccing frostbite again. Yes, yes. So quite cool that way, which is uh, what that frost flame shit is actually trying to achieve with um, Death's Poker. Uh, actually, no. Uh, Death's Poker oh, does. Is it not? Um, no, Death's Poker does magic damage. Oh. Ghost Flame is magic damage, not fire. Well, there you go. Fuck me. I mean, if it did fire damage, Jesus Christ, it'd be the best weapon in the game. We'd be using that, not the Great Stars. Yeah, you're probably right, actually. <laughs> so, again, uh, this looks like layer one. You are in layer two. Um, so, we're lowering that trap because apparently there's nothing of note up there, I guess. Um, if no, there that, was, we would that, have went up there. That one is how you escape the dungeon, I believe. So we've got to do the third loop, come back to layer two, and then escape the dungeon using that pillar. That sounds like that's probably true, yeah. If I'm not mistaken. Cool thing about this dungeon is because, like, we killed the omen that was here in layer one, so when you come to layer two, this one's inspecting the corpse of an omen. It's like, oh, cool, so... It's like time's progressing as you're going through and an omen found the one that we killed. No, yeah. it's all a trick. <laughs> yeah, it's just, yeah, yeah. So like, it really tries to fucking trip you up with this, like, three different things to make it seem like you're losing your fucking mind. Oh, I've already been here. I've already picked up a glove wart with two fucking skeleton guys in the room. But, yeah. It's yeah, cool. It's like I'm, we're talking shit, but it is it is a cool dungeon. I very much enjoyed this the first time I came through it as well. Yeah, no, no I, I do agree. It is, it is definitely one of the more interesting, unique things when they've kind of tried to mix up this way. So uh, we're on layer three, and then oh, we're back down into layer two because that's it for layer three. And now, like you said, the uh, the pillar that we lowered in layer two, we can actually use this again to come up here, and it. Again, it looks identical to the chapel in layer one with the omen in it, but there's actually this bit of door doorway passage here, and then this leads back to layer one. For some reason, there's just two imps here. Like of all the enemies they could have put here, there's just Being two a, imps now. It was a, it, previously it was all it was all putrid corpses and omens, but no, we it's a catacomb. We gotta have imps. So yeah, this is the ladder that will slide us back to uh, layer one. Yeah. Not only that, the, though, it's... Uh, yes, so we do need to remember there's the lever here. And then I think there's probably like a root resin or a golden rune or something. Sacramental bud. But yes, that is back us back on layer one. And now the boss room will be open. But we are going to go back to the start to heal up. Even though we do have 11... Crimson Flask, so we don't really need to heal up, I guess, but... So, we are changing our Ashes of War. Uh, apparently, we are putting on Wild Strikes, so there must be an NPC to fight. <laughs> that there is. Be, I, I, yeah. Yeah. The boss here is Esga, Priest of Blood, um, and he's accompanied by two of the Blood Dogs. So, um, it's a Sanguine so actually... Noble. No, it's not a Sanguine Noble. It's just an NPC. Oh. Um, he's dressed like a sanguine noble, but with a big hood. Um, yeah. Ah, we're using a fun trick here, actually. So, if you craft an uplifting aromatic, that's one of the perfume consumables, you have it in your hotbar. When you summon the mimic, the mimic can cast the uplifting aromatic to give himself a bubble shield, as well as the one that we have by using the physic flask. Um... A little trick if you are having trouble dealing with the dogs and the NPC at the same time. Wild Strike should solve that problem for you. But if you are having trouble, if you equip the Beast Repellent Torch, those dogs will not attack you. Yeah, there's so many ways of making this particular boss ungodly easy. <laughs> and to be clear though, I mean, he can still do a lot of fucking damage to you. Because he's using a Reduvia, so he can bleed you out very easily. So just try not to get caught out by that. There's no specific advice I can give you for how to avoid it. Yeah, but just don't the... get caught lacking. Yeah, but, yeah. I mean, I guess the, the, the absolute fucking best way is Great Stars with Wild Strikes plus the Beast Repellent Torch plus Mimic Tear. 
like plus there you go that's L how you that's how you beat that ratio thing. have you um, ever died to that guy is the question i want to know stick it in the comments if you have so when fighting moog because we cannot bleed moog and we cannot frost moog he is immune to all stats effects we are in fact just going to use prayerful strike on him because we're going to get we're, we're, we're going to get some value out of this fucking guy now again we're yeah. going to do the same thing with uh smith and stone six by the way we're going to do the same thing with uh the mimic tier where if we've got prayerful strike on our main uh weapon hand the mimic tier will also use it so pretty good for keeping the mimic tier alive because he'll keep himself alive because he'll just randomly fire out a fire out a prayerful strike now what we've done is put crag blade on our offhand great stars that'll give us a little bit more poise damage a little bit more damage with the jump attacks and um now moog does have a lot of uh bleed attacks like fat like fire um like blood flame attacks and they can be you know i mean as you see they do have they do like passive bleed build up but honestly prayerful strikes and jumping l1s it's really really good it, it means that you don't need to heal as much as you can see we've not used a single heal uh, you can use Moog Shackle as well, and then you just fucking lay into him. I'd suggest using Moog Shackle maybe after taking about a third of his HP off, because that's when you're going to get the most value out of it, I think. Yeah, probably, because you'll get further into his quote-unquote second phase where the Shackle no longer works before exactly. it no longer works. Um, I want to mention, actually, quickly, since we absolutely annihilated Moog, um, I think I have more challenge. footage, I think. Oh, yeah? Um, cool, think, that gives so. me some time to talk, if that's the case. But uh, we got Blood Flame Talons. It's a very good incantation. Um, builds up a lot of bleed, does fire damage, staggers smaller enemies. It's generally pretty great. Um, but the Talisman we got as a reward for the previous boss, um, Ezga, was the Lord of Blood's Exaltation, which is a Talisman that pays dividends on any kind of bleed build. So whenever you inflict bleed on an enemy or receive bleed from an enemy, you get a 20% damage buff. Um, this is incredible if you are using paired uh, blood curved swords. So something like the scavenger's curved sword or the bandit's curved sword with the blood infusion. If you stack those two things together, you can get some absolutely crazy damage numbers out of it, especially on jump attacks. This is, this is true, yeah. Now, we're using just a... Really, we're just doing jump, jumping L1s or Lion's Claw or Prayerful Strike is just kind of the way to go with this. Um, because you can't bleed Moog, uh, Wild Strikes isn't really uh, recommended. I, I would say uh, Lion's Claw or Prayerful Strike is the best way to go. Um, Lion's Claw when you, when uh, he has your attention, Prayerful Strike when he's got the Nemex Tears attention is uh, probably the, the the most optimum setup. But as you can see, uh, at this level with this setup, um, you're able to stagger Moog quite a lot. You've got the Moog Shackle, so you're still able to get in a lot of quote unquote free damage. But there you go, there's there's a strategy for Moog. Uh, you just bonk him in the head. Pick it up a direct upgrade there to the uh, tree's favor, the uh, tree's favor plus one. And does this give us enough? Can we now roll with Lionel's headpiece on? I'm sad to see the red plume go. So we're heading to the merchant shack, but yes, it would appear that this does mean that we, we are now just on a light roll with this uh, setup, which is quite nice. So it feels comfy with the 40 endurance, it's a nice round number. But yeah, now we are heading down, back down to the, the, the lake or the moat or whatever you want to call it, back down to Bogger. We've already spoken to him earlier. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so we're going to speak to him. He talks about how the um, the dung eater is floating about. Then we're going to quit out, head back in. And uh, the dung eater has got his dirty fucking hands on him. <laughs> yeah, he has defiled Bogger from which you get the Blackguard's Iron Mask, the Iron Ball, which is just the Starfist, but worse. Uh, the Blackguard's Bell Bearing, or Boggart's Bell Bearing. Um, so you can get the Infinite Crabs and Prawns from the Twin Maiden Husks now, as well as another Seedbed Curse. That's the one I was talking about in the previous part that's kind of optional. 
because you can still get the Dung Eater's ending even if um, you've already killed the Boggart as part of Raya's quest. Uh, this is this, yeah, this is true. Now, um, as you can see, the Jumping L ones were still decent enough against the um, the Dung Eater. We get the Sword of Milo's for killing him. But strictly speaking, if you're uh, struggling against them, then yes, of course, Wild Strikes is going to absolutely mince the Dung Eater as it does with any other NPC. And by NPC, we mean characters that are like you, like just humans that were like people, like characters that are made in the character creator, if you get what I mean. Uh, so now we're heading back to Roundtable Hold, and now we can speak to the Dung Eater, and I think this sends him to the Shunning Grounds, I think? Yeah, it sends him back to his jail cell. Um, as part of his quest, he now thinks that you are him. Um, you are he, if you will. And uh, now when you head back to the Shunning Grounds, which I think we'll be doing shortly. Oh, is it, are we progressing Nephili's quest? It would appear we are. So this we're is a nice surprise. surprise. The, uh, the, was the Stormhawk something? The Stormhawk King, Ash, yeah. Right, yes. That, so for those of you who haven't seen that part, we picked up from one of the four Belfries teleports, the one that takes you to the Precipice of Anticipation, which is the area we started the game in. Yes, so that should be Leornia West. Yes. No, yes, West. So, uh, so obviously we went to Nefeli, we exhausted our dialogue after giving her the, uh, the Stormhawk King's Ashes, and then after doing that, we're going to come back to the Dung Eater in the Sewer Jail. So now he wants five Seed Bed Curse. We, only, we should have four of them currently. But what we're actually going to do is give him Soluvis' Potion that we were supposed to give to Nefeli. But we're actually going to give it to Dung Eater. Now what you're going to do is you're going to give it to Dung Eater and then you're going to wait. Because I don't know how long it is before it's safe to actually do this. So wait 20 seconds, 30 seconds, just to be certain. But if you kill him, he will still drop his armor set. Now, this is, you're supposed to miss out on the armor set if you give him Solivus' potion. That's the trade-off that's supposed to be the case, but you can apparently just kill him when he's on the chair because what you're supposed, because what Solivus has wanted was the Nef Nefeli. You want to give uh, Nefeli the potion, and then that turns her into Solivus's puppet. But instead, we're going to give it to the Dung Eater. Now, as we killed the Dung Eater on the chair, he can't turn into the puppet, so he doesn't show up here, and it implies that you've, you, you, know, you maybe have failed the quest by doing so, but actually the game just works out perfectly. If you were to give Nefeli the potion, or not kill the Dung Eater, either Nefeli or Dung Eater would show up here, but you can just not give the potion to Nefeli, give it to Dung Eater, that way you can complete Nefeli's quest, and then you can still kill Dung Eater, get the armor set. Hi, Edit and Tony again. I know, it's been a while, but something really needs to be mentioned. In order to actually progress Solivus' quest, and more specifically his dialogue options, you actually ha you have to buy all of his spells in his inventory. Also, just pay very careful attention to specifically the dialogue options that we're picking, and what we're doing, because we do go through it quite quickly. So, if you've done what we've done, the only thing you miss out on in the entire game is Nefeli Lou's puppet and the Dung Eater ending, which you can just watch on YouTube anyway. So, we're speaking to Solivis, and we're going to ask him about his chambers, seeing as we have discovered them, like we just did. So then he will offer us a free puppet, which is one of his spirit summons that we get, and then we also are going to buy all of his sorceries, because we have to clear out everything from to progress his quest, essentially. Now, we need to return to Grace, and then come straight back here, so we just cut that bit out and then we can ask for we want another puppet. Uh, so this is what Starlight Shards are used for, and also, depending on if you gave the potion to either Dung Eater or Nefeli, that's the puppet that you can buy. So we're going to buy the Dung Eater puppet and the other puppet with the Starlight Shards, and then, now we've done all of that, we've bought all his puppets and bought all his spells, we can ask him about his scheme. He'll say you're interested, he'll ask you to go get the Amber Starlight Shards, which we have already gotten, so we don't need to go and do it, we can just immediately give him the Amber Starlight Shards, and thus, as a result, we can get the Magic Scorpion Charm. Now, I think you need to speak to him again right at the end because he's a prick. And that's how you get the Magic Scorpion Charm. So just make sure you double exhaust all his dialogue. And now, we're going to warp to Godric the Grafted. 
Right, and at this point, it looks like we are going to be finishing Nefeli's quest. Yes, because as we the gave Nefeli way... the Stormhawk King's Ashes, we can just keep coming back to Godric the Graffid, uh, this boss, this um, this grace. Actually, like it looked like it wasn't working. You just need to keep warping back here until eventually he disappears. There we go. So once he disappears, that's you. The quest is done. Because we've given Nefeli the Stormheart King's Ashes, because we didn't give her the potion, she is now uh, the ruler of Stormvale or whatever. Yeah, um, Kenneth Hype was looking for a true, a right and proper heir to the throne of Stormvale. Um, tried to knight you but couldn't because there wasn't a lord. Um, Nefeli is of royal blood and so can take the throne. Kenneth has moved here. Um, to be effectively her steward. Gostock decided he didn't want freedom and he just wants to loot the dead, so he stuck around as well. We can buy an Ancient Dragon Smithing Stone from him, which is effectively a Titanite slab. It's a max level upgrade, and Nefeli also gave us one for completing her quest in this way. And having done this now, Nefeli becomes available as a summon, like a gold summon sign, for one of the endgame bosses. So now we're here, we can speak to uh, Melina. Uh, she's going to talk to you about the uh, the frenzied flame, and uh, you can listen to her or not. But we're going to show you what you can do now, because this bit is very fucking cool. Although I'm assuming most of you know about it by this point. Um, there is n this. This is actually the ending that we're going to get, or one of the endings we're going to get, because again, we do not need to do the dung eater ending. So to reiterate. Because we're not doing the Dung Eater ending, we can just get his equipment. However, if the Dung Eater ending was tied to uh, an achievement, we would have to do that. But as it isn't, fuck it. Just watch it on YouTube. What are, what are you missing out on? <laughs> so we hit the altar inside uh, Moog the Omen's boss room. And behind the altar is a secret area this would be locked if you had not killed morgoth so you can only come here after killing morgoth these are the nomads that you would be able to summon with the nomads ashes that i talked about earlier in this part and what we're doing here is a little trick to smash these tents because when you save quit and load back in it thinks your position is inside the tent and so breaks it so you don't get stuck which is it's a nice not little... quite that. It's what it does is it just will automatically, like, it's just part of the game. It does this, even in Dark Souls 1 it does this. If you quit out and quit back in, it will send a little invisible ball of smash everything around you just on the off chance that you've smashed something in game and then when you've loaded back in, you spawn inside it. So to get around that, it just destroys anything that's destructible around you. Now, as we've just uh, discovered in a comment... Um, and there's a friend to Cookbook too, by the way. But as we've just discovered in a comment about a day or two ago, um, you can do this to smash those rocks that have smithing stones in them. So essentially, you go up to the rock, quit out, load back in, and it should smash the rock, and this means you don't need to aggro a rune bear or a troll in order to smash the rock for you. Okay, so pay very close attention to what it is that we're doing just now, right? We are naked, so thus we are at the lowest under 30% roll weight, and we're going to jump into this corner here. There's a very specific series of things you need to do. So then we're going to jump into the corner, roll onto this platform, roll onto it, walk onto this one, then we're going to roll, line ourselves up and roll diagonally onto this one, and then roll onto this one. Then a very controlled jump onto the one to the bottom, and then we can get the Inescapable Frenzy Incantation. Hopefully you paid attention to all that. I believe that's the one that functions like a grab attack, where you can grab hold of somebody and frenzy the shit out of them. Very cool. We grabbed the Fingerprint Stone Shield, um, arguably the best shield in the game. It has very, very good damage, um, very good damage resistance, but it is exceptionally heavy. Uh, now, it looked like we missed an item in one of the tents there. We didn't. That is just a letter. Um, it's just like a, a... You can get it if you want, but for the sake of a little bit of speed, uh, we're just like... It's it's just like a story item, so you really don't need to get it. So now we've reached the grace down at the bottom of here. We can talk to Melina, and she's fucking begging you. Please do not go into that fucking room. Please. <laughs> Fuck you. I do what I want. <laughs> So 
So this is Hieta, if you remember her from about 20 parts ago. Uh, this is where she ended up after you gave her the fingerprint grape. Now, you can take off all your equipment and go into the big room at the end and get uh, the Frenzied Flame Blessing or whatever, but we're not going to do that just yet because you can do it at any point in the game. So just wait until Mountaintops of the Giants before doing so. So as part of the guide, just wait until then. That is when we recommend to do that. But otherwise, um, we... Oh, fuck. That's it. Fuck. <laughs> Please leave that in the edit. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to just extend this. Otherwise, we went into the, deep, the very start of the Deep Root Depths, we grabbed that grace, and then we warped back to Rani's Rise because we're going to have to need her for the next part. And okay, there we go. That's the shunning ground. Done. Join us in part 31, where we're going to be doing Noxtella. Now, other than liking and subscribing, you can follow us on Twitter. You can also follow us on Twitch, where we will be streaming once the DLC is out. And if you're feeling especially generous, you can sling us some cash on Patreon if you're so inclined. But the best thing you can do is just comment anything. Just comment anything. Go on. Anything. Two seconds. Go on. Anyway, catch you in the next part.